Ah, uh, how we doing today, folks? I got a real treat of a video for you today. I really done my homework on this one, and I think that higher production effort's gonna show. Coming at you today from the Dune Swale. This is a globally imperiled ecosystem, so today we're gonna be seeing a whole load of stuff that you wouldn't be seeing elsewhere. Now let's talk about the Dune Swale ecosystem, shall we? It's characterized by the landscape here, and we're gonna talk about that more as we really dig into it. But what it's characterized by are these alternating ridges of upland, the dune, and then these alternating ridges of lowland, swale. And these are laid out parallel to one another, and they run parallel to the lake, actually. So you get that cool ridges. You get that cool ridge topography. But you might be asking yourself, what caused that? It's the historic advancement and recession of the lake which is caused by uh, changing water levels which give this habitat its unique topography. And as I touched on earlier, given that it's dune swale, we've got elements of upland and wetland ecosystems, which means it's really, really biodiverse and a pretty badass ecosystem to run around in for anyone that's a fan of the flora and the fauna. So it's going to be a great time. We're also going to be discussing a little bit more of the scientific stuff here and more of the ecology. We're going to get into a concept right now called natural divisions. And the best way to think of natural divisions are another way of dividing up the land, however it uses natural features rather than political borders and things of that nature, which really are uh, kind of a mess when you really break it down. Now here's a quote that I pulled on natural divisions to really give you guys like a good solid ecological definition of it. Divisions contain, quote, similar landscapes, climates, substrate features like bedrock and soils that support similar vegetation and wildlife over the division's area. And that's coming at you from the former state botanist of Illinois, John Schwegman, in 1973. So basically what that is to say is that similar divisions contain similar ecology. They've got similar habitats, similar people that call them home. So that's how, that's how we're going to be thinking the natural divisions. The natural division that we're shooting at today, we're in the Lake Plain Natural Division, specifically the Gary Re Beach Ridge Plain section of it. Now this is made up of four different vegetative communities, all right? We got the calcareous sand prairie, some black oak savanna elements, marsh, and shallow pools. So that we're going to be, we're going to be doing a lot of those, we're, that's what, yeah, man, if I could talk. So that's what we're going to be focusing in on today is the flora of those four different habitat types because that's what we're working with in this particular dune swale, in this particular uh, dune swale section. All right, so with that, let's get into the flora of the area, shall we? And we're going to kick off the flora with my personal favorite of those four habitats that we get in this, uh, in this natural division, which is the calcareous sand prairie. Now, it's really cool where that calcium's coming from because it's coming up from the bedrock. The bedrock here is known as the Wabash Formation, and it's made up primarily of limestone and dolomite. And both of those are sedimentary rocks which are calcareous in nature. And as a result of that bedrock, we got a vegetative community here that is chock full of calcifiles. And a calcifile is just a plant that thrives under calcareous conditions. We're probably going to be spending a lot of time here because there's a lot of neat characters that call this particular ecosystem home. And I think that with all that background out of the way, we're actually going to get into the nitty gritty and talk some flowers. How does that sound to everybody? And we're going to kick things off with this beautiful shrub in the rose family. Let's get a nice focused shot of that Corolla. Beautiful. This is Dasiphora fructuosa, the shrubby cincofoil. Gets that name from its growth habit and from the fact that it was formerly classified as a cincofoil before it got moved into the genus Dasiphora. This one's, now I'm going to call things calcifiles a lot in this section because we are in a calcareous sand prairie. So keep that in mind, but this right here. This is a fine example of a calcifile, which means, again, it's a plant that thrives under calcareous soil conditions. We're going to be pointing out a lot of calcifiles, as I've already explained. Here's another one right now. This is Cladium marzacoides, the twig rush coming at you from the Cyperaceae. A beautiful sedge, this one. You get it a lot in, again, the calcareous soils. I'm really hammering this point home, and I think you guys get it at this point. What other species do we got calling this area home? Got this one right here. This is a lovely uh, member of the mint family, the Lamiaceae. Let me get closer so I can get a nice, get a nice close shot of the Corolla. Like I said, this is the low calamint, Clanopodium arkansana. Sorry, just trying to clear some vegetation so you can get a nice look at the flowers on this. This is stain imperiled in Indiana, so you're really only going to see this in high quality dune swale ecosystems. So it's a real treat to be able to come out to habitat and witness these rare plants really seeming to flourish in their uh, native ecology. Another state listed plant that we've got occurring in local abundance is this one, Triantha glutinosa, the false asphodel. 
Hang on. Let's see if the camera will focus on it. There we go. Beautiful. This plant is very... What's notable about this plant is that it's got a relative occurring on the west coast, Trianthoxin and Talus, and that's recently been proven to be a carnivore. And it employs carnivory because it's got glandular hairs on its scape. And the scape, by the way, is what you call this, this flowering stalk that you get here in some plants. So that's the scape, note that. But anyway, it's got glandular hairs on the scape and bugs get stuck to those glandular hairs and the plant is able to digest them. So I had a similar hypothesis if this could be occurring in Triantha glutinosa because Triantha glutinosa has also got glandular hairs on the scape. And uh, a friend of mine, Nathaniel and I, we ran around this same preserve actually and took some shots and I'm gonna try to insert them in this video but it looks like, as you can see in these pictures, looks like bugs bugs are getting attached to the scape of these plants, which makes me wonder, is this guy exhibiting carnivory in the same way that its western cousin is? I don't know, I'd have to do a lot more research and do some uh, isotopic analysis of the nitrogen and stuff like that. It'd be very, very interesting, I think. But uh, anyway, that's kind of getting beside the point. Remember, Triantha glutinosa, beautiful, having a great time. This is Lizomachia quadriflora, one of our native loose stripes. I'll show you the loose strife that actually really looks like an invasive loose strife in a minute here. Let me turn this flower around for you so you can see the interior of the uh, corolla. Isn't that nice? The Lizomachias, the native loose strife. Well, not all the Lizomachias are natives, but the majority of them are. Anyway, let's keep moving along in this Calcarea sand prairie, see what other calcifiles we can run into. This is Bucknera americana, the American blue heart. It's a beautiful plant in the Orobankaceae. Now, like I mentioned in that Oak Savannah video, the Orobankaceae is a pretty notable family because most of the plants in it, or, or pretty much all the plants in the Orobankaceae, are exhibiting parasitism in some degree. This one you can see right here. This one's still got green tissue, so it's still got chlorophyll, so it can still photosynthesize. So this is going to be what you would call a hemiparasite, just the same way that that Oriolaria was. Like a, uh, a holoparasite would be like completely... It would, have, uh, it would have no chlorophyll in it. So and a good example of that would be like Conophilus americana, the bear corn. But anyway, that right there is Bucknera americana. Just a beautiful plant that you get occurring in the dune swale system. I'm not sure how this fits into the whole ecology picture here, but uh, depending on who its host is, but uh, I'll try to figure that out and let you guys know in a nice little, nice little sidebar of information, but just a beautiful plant that I had to stop and point out. Now what's going off right next to it in absolute abundance is a desmodium, and I think this is vegetation that you would get more typically in that oak savanna. I think this is De desmodium illinoisans or desmodium canadens. I'm not as good with my desmodiums as I should be, but this is a plant in the Fabaceae. So we've got, of course, our banner wings and keel floral structure, and we've got a compound leaf, this one with three leaflets. Absolutely beautiful. So a desmodium and a bucknera. Not sure how they fit into the whole picture here, but you can bet I'm gonna try to address it somehow. It's also got Monarda fistulosa, Leatra spicata. Oh, it's beautiful out here, folks. I just can't state it enough. So I've shown you guys the uh, the native Lizomachia. This is one. Of, this is the native Lithrum, and you might be familiar with the Lithrums because of purple loosestrife, which is a pretty pretty well known invasive plant. It's very very aggressive, and it causes a lot of habitat degradation and things of that nature. So you might be familiar with the Lithrums as a result of that. But this is our native Lithrum. And it's pretty easy to distinguish from the purple loosestrife if you know what you're looking for. First and foremost, the uh, flowers in the native loosestrife occur solitarily. Okay, so loosestrife will have multiple flowers per point at the axle. However, the native loosestrife will only have one. And then we can also look at the foliage to make a distinction. The foliage in purple loosestrife is going to be completely opposite, while in the native loosestrife, it's sub-opposite, as you can see there. So you can see it's close to opposite, but not quite. And that's what you call being sub-opposite, all right? And uh, that's how you distinguish your native Lithrum alata from the highly invasive Lithrum salicaria. I've seen someone with Lithrum salicaria in their front lawn, actually, which really just makes me want to puke. They've got a Make America Great Again sign, too, so they really know what they're doing. Make America Great Again with invasive junk. Anyways, this is Rhincospora capillacea. Nice sedge to take my mind off the junk in the world, you know? Sometimes it really helps you unwind. Oh, yeah. That's a beautiful sedge, I think. There's another nice flower going off over here. Uh, Sebacea angularis in the Gentianaceae. That's this one right here. 
Some of the gentians are hemiparasites as well, actually, but I couldn't find any papers uh, demonstrating if that was the case with the sebaceous. Let me rotate so I can get a good look at this Corolla, because they're really, these are beautiful. Oh, yeah. Get a load of those. I'm trying to be less shaky with my camera today. I hope you guys are taking note of that. Because some guy left a real mean comment about how like, it was like a tilt-a-whirl, which like, hey, man, I get that I'm shaky, but, you know, I'm a person with feelings too, you know. Or at least, like, I try, you know. Anyways. So one last, cal one last calcifile for the road, I think, and then we're going to get into the, uh, the other, one of the other ecosystem types that we get in this natural division, which is the shallow pools. But before we do that, let's talk about this spectacular flower. This is Lobelia colmii, Colm's Lobelia. It's in the Campanulaceae, more specifically the Lobelioidea subfamily. If you still, uh, if you still got the Lobelioids split off from the Campanulas, don't know how I feel about that. Haven't done enough research to really make a, really make a, a, a hot botanical, uh, hot botanical opinion about it. But uh, anyway, yeah. So another calcifile to wrap up wrap up what's going on in the Calcarea sand prairie. And we're gonna move into the adjacent lowland to talk about what's going on in the shallow pool ecosystem. Oh yeah, it's pretty nice that all these ecosystems run so close together. It makes it real easy on the walk-in. But we've got, what we've got a carpet of, by the way, is Proserpinaca palustris. Proserpinaca, I think I'm saying that right. But that's the mermaid weed and the Halogeraceae. It's a lovely plant. We've got it uh, as well in this nice pool is Pontidaria cordata and the Pontidariaceae, the pickerel weed. Beautiful. And what we've got occurring as well, this is the advantage of wearing chest waders, is that I can go into the deeper water. I'm actually going to go over there because that's where the flower is. We're going to talk about Nymphaea odorata, which is a lovely, a lovely plant, I think. Oh yeah, beautiful, now that the camera's actually focused. Let's head on over. So this is Nymphaea odorata, and what's pretty neat about Nymphaea odorata is the lineage of plants that it comes from. Now it's in the nymph Nymphialia's order, and what's cool about that is that that's an order of plants which belongs to a group known as the basal angiosperms. And what that means in so many words is, what, as far as the evolution of land plants is concerned, the basal angiosperms were some of the first groups that diverged from the lineage that gave rise to most of the major angiosperm groups that we have today, the mesangiosperms. But the basal angiosperms, they said, yeah, that mes mesangiosperm business is all well and good, but we're going to diverge earlier than that. So here's a fantastic example of one of those primitive flowers with that spiral arrangement and the pistil and carpal, I believe? No. I think it's anthers and carpels. I don't know exactly. But anyway, Nymphaea odorata, folks, a basal angiosperm. Pretty neat to see that still extant today. We've also got an abundance of the tool rush, Schenoplectus acutus. There's a ton of ethnobotanical uses for that plant. It's well documented. Very cool stuff, and just a ton of these wonderful Nymphaea odorata leaves everywhere. It's a beautiful ecosystem because you've just got these really, you've got, you've got, pr you got wet prairies running into pools and then you've got oak savannas as well oh it's just magnificent out here oh yeah so this i think will be a pretty neat demonstration of how quickly the land can change given this dune swales alternating ridge topography i'm in a lowland right now it looks like a mud flat basically but what i was kneeling on the ground to check out is this mass bloom of utricularia gibba I see this one a lot on the mud flats. That's why I'm so confident on the ID in this utricularia, because sometimes they can be a little bit tricky. But the utricularias are notable, of course, for being carnivorous plants. They've got tiny little bladders on them, and I'm going to try to explain them properly. So the way those tiny little bladders work is that they hang closed, all right? And then they've got little sensory hairs about the rim. And then when some little critter comes past those sensory hairs and trips them off, the bladder door swings open, creating a negative pressure space which sucks in whatever just swam past the opening, and then it seals shut again, digesting whatever's just been internalized. It's one of the fastest moving things in nature, actually. Very, very cool stuff in the bladder warts. I might show you guys another one if I have the energy to go run over to it. We'll find out. But anyway, like I was saying, we got a mass bloom of Utricularia gibba, and then we're going to swing up to the adjacent upland because we got some plants in there that are characteristic of the upland ecosystem. And that's pretty neat to see, I think. 
just that rapid change. But the plants that I was going to point out, we've got, of course, Picnanthemum virginianum, a returning member of our cast of characters from the prairies. At least I think this is virginianum. I see hairs on the angles. It's virginianum, Picnanthemum virginianum. We've got as well, Monarda fistulosa. Beautiful. We've got Betula pep peperifera, the paper birch. That's a facultative upland tree, which means that most of the time it's going to be occurring in upland ecosystems, while occasionally occurring in wetland ecosystems. And we've got as well as um, uh, uh, Ruscopolinum, the shining sumac, or the winged sumac. So just a real quick, it's almost jarring how fast the ecosystems can change out here. Just a really cool thing to demonstrate. Another indicator that we're kind of in more of an upland is this guy down here. This is Euphorbia corallata in the Euphorbiaceae, the Spurge family. That's a very neat little group of plants. Beautiful little corollas there. Oh yeah, having a great time out here today, folks. And then there was another plant that I wanted to show you guys that was doing something really cool. Here. Oh, hang on, give me a second. Oh, never mind, here we go. Okay. So this right here, this beautiful red plant. This is Castilea coccinea, the scarlet paintbrush. It is a member of the Orobancaceae as well, similar to that Buckner Americana, the American Blue Hearts. You can see the flower there. Guess who it's trying to attract with that red tubular inflorescence? If you're guessing hummingbirds, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. But anyway, so that's Castilea coccinea. But what it can also do is have a yellow form, which is called Castilea coccinea formalutescence. And I had formerly only seen this in Michigan, but I'm very happy to report that it's happening down in Indiana as well. Isn't that stunning? Oh God, that'll just blow your mind. And these guys are, of course, being in the Orobancaceae. Say it with me, folks. These are hemiparasites because, again, we can still they see still we can see that they've still got some green tissue on them, meaning they've still got the chlorophyll. But you know, they're also up to some trickery down below the soil, probably parasitizing off the neighbors. Ah, oh, what a spectacular place this is, folks. Absolutely wonderful. Folks, this right here is a, uh, this is a very neat aster. This is a Liga Neuron album. And what's neat about it is, of course, it's phylogenetic history, because the tech, or sorry, it's taxonomic history, because this little guy's been moved around a lot. It's formerly, it was formerly an aster, okay? I don't know what the exact species was, probably Aster Boreal, I want to say. But anyway, it formerly an aster. But then what happened was the asters got split up because there are new world asters and old world asters. And when that split occurred, the uh, old world asters were referred to as the genus Aster, and the new world asters got brought up into a whole bunch of genus, most notably being Symphia trichum, but there's also Dolingeria, and of course there's Oligoneuron. And this is a member of the Oligoneuron, so it's just a very cool, just a cool reminder that science and taxonomy are always changing, things are always flowing one way or the other, and it's pretty neat to just kind of be a part of that, you know? Just taking note of it, and always taking, trying, to, uh, trying to keep up with the most recent scientific evidence. Oh yeah, what what musings we have out in these trips. So we've got three Liatra species occurring in a pretty small area, so I figure, hey, we might as well talk about them real quick. First and foremost, we've got this one that's in bloom. This is Liatra cylindracea, the cylindrical blazing star, the cylindrical gay feather. Don't know what, it doesn't really matter what common name you use to, uh, you use to identify it, just call it Liatra cylindracea when you, uh, when you want to be serious, por favor. But anyway, we've got Liatra cylindracea right here. And what we've got over here is we've got Liatra aspera, notable for having these globose and uh, sessile heads on the uh, flowering spike. And then we've got Liatra spicata, the marsh blazing star. And all of these will light up with, a, with those typical um, Eutrochiae, Eutro Eutrochiae, uh, Eupatoria subfamily, Joe Pieweed subfamily flowers which have only the disc florets on them, no ray florets. And remember, of course, in the Asteraceae, that disc and ray florent morphology that you get in the Capitulum. I'm not quite sure what more I have to show you guys while I'm out here. I'm going to try to keep this video nice and short. I think I've hit on the major points, though, so we're going to try and see some more neat shit. And if I can't find it, well, then we're just going to call it a video, I think. 
And we're back into the shallow pools to show off another uh, another basal angiosperm. This one is uh, Brasenia shreberi in the uh, Cabombaceae. But what I really like about this plant is its common name, which is goo plant. And it gets that name, as you can see. See that goo in between my fingers that I got from rubbing the underside of this plant? Anyway, why might, why might a plant have its undersides covered in goop? Well, in the example of Brasenia shreberi, it actually has that kind of goo on it as an adaptation to defend against herbivory from uh, water snails, actually. And that goo will cover most of, the organ most of the organs on that plant under the surface, so it'll cover the underside of the leaves, the stems, and the flower buds and stuff like that until they mature. It's a very, very cool plant, Brasenia shreberi, goo plant. Now you know. And to close this video, we'll just do a nice, a nice glamour shot of uh, Utricularia purpurea, the purple bladderwort. Isn't that a beautiful flower? Almost dropped my phone there. Anyway, hope you folks enjoyed this video. Have a good one out there. Maybe get outside, take a hike, and enjoy nature or something. I'm not the boss.